Good afternoon, everyone. Here we go again. Um, very excited to welcome my friend who's very patient and kind, uh, Bob Knackle, who is the founding partner and chairman of Massey Knackle, uh, and as well as chairman of JLL Capital Markets. Um, thanks so much, Bob, for being here. And I also just want to mention that Bob is personally responsible for the sale of over 2,000 buildings. So, you know, Bob, I don't know if there's, if there's anybody better than you, more knowledgeable. So thank you for joining us today. Um, talk to us a little bit about New York City investment sales market. What's going on? Well, Bess, first of all, my pleasure to be here today. It's always, always nice to be with you. And uh, yeah, the you can tell by the gray hair and the beard. I have been around for a while. In fact, in July, I start year number 39 in this crazy business. So um, it's, been, uh, it's been, no, I still, still love it as much as when I started. Um, but the investment sales market in New York, uh, I can, can portray it as a heck of a lot better than it was a year or two ago, but not quite uh, where it was at the peak of the market. And I think to really understand where the market is and where it's going, it's important to have some historical perspective. So I'll take you back to the peak of the market in 2014 and 2015. Uh, in 2014, we had more buildings sell than ever before in the history of New York City. 5,534 buildings were sold. That was an all-time record by more than 10%. Followed up in 2015 with $80.1 billion in dollar volume of sales, also an all-time record. Um, and in late September, early October of 2015, there was a very tangible shift in the market. Um, we saw in the land market all of a sudden the offers we were getting on development sites were way down um, the cap rates on hotels were going way up uh, and those are two sectors that we actually watch very closely because they're the most highly reactive to changes in the marketplace hotels because leases are only for one day uh, and land because land's indicative of what people believe market conditions will be like two or three years from today um, so we saw changes and what that started really was a correction in New York City investment sales. So from October of 15 through February of 20, we had a, um, a correction that was mostly on the volume side. The volume of sales had fallen by 56% over that period of time. Values were down a little bit, but only maybe about 10 to 12% if you blend all property types together. And then COVID comes along in March of 2020 and converts what was a mostly volume correction into a value correction. Uh, land, retail, and uh, hotels were hit the hardest. Um, and values in those three sectors in Manhattan were down by as much as 50% uh, in some cases. Um, but the market started to come back. And I, I think based on the, uh, the very robust first quarter of 2021, on the residential side, um, you know, we, we had a period, it was like the uh, April 10th, 12th, 13th, something like that. All of a sudden my phone's ringing off the hook from private equity companies who I guess have, have read your first quarter residential reports about rents and condo prices and absorption being so great. And they're like, look, we wanna get back into the market. Who's buying development sites? We wanna provide equity for them. Uh, and it really shifted things. And so I think we've been, uh, on an upswing since April of 2021. Uh, there's been upward pressure exerted on, on property values. And to give you some recent perspective, um, in 2011, if we look at, at investment sales, just over $10 million in value. Uh, the peak was in 2015, that was $57.5 billion of activity. In 2020, during COVID, that dropped to $11.2 billion. Um, and you would think that uh, that clearly would have been the uh, the low point, given what was happening with COVID at that time. But in 2021, through the first three quarters, if we annualize the first three quarters, we were at less than 10 billion for 2021. But we we got pulled out of it with a great uh, fourth quarter, 8.6 billion in sales in the fourth quarter of 21, followed up by 8.6 billion in the first quarter of of 22. Those were the two best back-to-back -back quarters we've had in sales volume going back to the second and third quarters of 2016, which were 12 billion and 11.1 billion respectively. So markets on pace this year to be up to about 34.4 billion, which would be about double 
where we were last year. Um, and that's one of the two V's when we look at, at volume metrics, we look at um, value uh, and volume. And in, within volume, we look at dollar volume of sales, but we also look at the number of properties sold, which in our, our business, the number of properties sold is much more indicative of the actual activity, mainly because you could have a couple of $2 billion or $3 billion transactions that skew that dollar volume very significantly. So if we look at the number of properties sold, um, we go back to, again, in the over $10 million category, 484 properties were sold in 2015. That was the peak. Uh, it was down as low as 104 uh, in uh, 2020. And we've been climbing back 191 last year. We're on pace for 220 this year. So, you know, nice increases in both of those uh, in both of those metrics. So a heck of a lot better than it was, but not quite where it was at the peak. How do you, Bob, how do you remember all those numbers? Like, you know, every exact number. Is that something you always do? You always just like it's your craft of what you care about deeply is all those little details? You know, Bess, if you think about it as, as real estate brokers, probably the number one question that we're asked every day is how's the market? <laughs> and 99.9% .9 of brokers answer that question with adjectives. Uh, I found that if you answer with statistics, uh, you can let the listener make up their mind about whether it's good, bad, or ugly. So I've always been, you know, I, it goes back to my baseball playing days in college where I, I tracked all of my pitching statistics very, very carefully, uh, knew what my ERA was practically inning wow. by inning. So, uh, and it just carried it. into carried into real estate. And uh, I love tracking the numbers. It's all about the numbers. You're talking about, yeah, you're giving facts. I think you should be a coach for the girls on Selling Sunset because everything is awesome oh my god stunning fabulous you know there's like no facts it's all just you know everything's great and, and groovy and you know let's see so i think they should hire you bob i'm going to talk to them about that no but you know what on, on a serious note i think if if we all as brokers had a a couple of um bullet points or a couple of talking points about you know, what the volume of sales has been, what absorption has been, is it up X percent, down Y percent, what is it? I think the, the, the person you're speaking to is going to think, wow, they really understand the market. And, right. uh, you know, that's what we want. We were trying to engender confidence from our clients. And, uh, you know, if it seems like you really understand uh, the subject matter, it, it engenders that confidence. I agree. I mean, Greg Heim, who's our chief economist, helps us with that. He gives, feeds us a lot of information. I also really love the Ocean Report because we can track, you know, $4 million contracts and that helps to give you an idea of where luxury is. And so there's a lot of things that agents use, but you're a great resource. And um, talk to me a little bit about inflation and higher rates. How do you, how is that impacting your market? Well, well it's having a, a big impact. In fact, I, I sent out an email to um, to my client base asking for feedback on what their their top concerns were moving forward. And this was sent out in early April uh, and I got about 847 responses. And the number three thing on the list at that time was interest rates um, and inflation. And I think if I had sent that that survey out uh, a month and a half later, I think it would have been number one. Um, but clearly it's having an impact. We've seen what's happened with interest rates. Um, and, you know, the thing about interest rates, I think there's a misconception that anytime rates rise, it's bad for real estate. One thing I can tell you definitively is when rates drop, it's great for real estate 100% of the time. When rates go up, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And in today's inflationary environment, when you have inflation and costs are going up, right. yes, Lending rates go up, so cap rates have to go up. When cap rates go up, value typically goes down. However, in an inflationary environment, you have upward pressure on rents. You have uh, upward pressure on costs as well. But it could be that, you know, the real estate is hard assets are good hedges against inflation. So we're hoping that people take money out of the stock market, maybe put it into real estate as a hedge. Because when you reset your rents, you're going to be able to take advantage of this inflation. Um, so rates are going up. And also with rates going up, it depends why rates are going up, not necessarily if they're going up. Uh, if rates are going up for the wrong reasons, 
that's a bad thing. If they're going up because there's tangible traction in the broader economy, that's a great thing. Um, I think we have a little of both right now. So I think it's a little too early to tell whether it's because of all the the, the monetary and fiscal policy that the government has been implementing is really having the impact on on inflation or is there is there underlying tangible traction that has been kind of masked by the uh, by the pandemic that is now just exploding. Uh, we'll see which it, which it is, but I think it's just a little too early to tell at this time. And you you can sense that there's a bit of fear right now, a little bit. At least we see that in the stock market. You're seeing, you know, it's a little topsy turvy as to what's going on. And, uh, you know, so we're going to have to see how that all plays out. Um, what do you think about retail in New York City? Well, Where are they going to? Yeah, well, I think retail has been um, been given uh, too bad a rap. Uh, I think clearly the face of retail has changed. And I think one of those changes um, is that uh, retailers have kind of figured out that they shouldn't be warehousing and, and selling goods out of the same very, very expensive space. So uh, that is what has really prompted the explosion of, of the industrial market uh, across the country and even here in New York. Uh, a lot of retailers figuring out how to deliver goods uh, next day or same day. Uh, and so I think the footprint that they can have can be smaller. Clearly, the pandemic had a, a devastating effect on a lot of retail. Uh, but inherently, I think people like to go out and get into a store and, and shop and experience that uh, as opposed to shopping online. I think there's a nice balance that, that people want to feel. So um, in the long term, I'm, I'm very... Uh, bullish on retail. I think retail is going to do well, uh, but it's been one of the two markets. The retail market and the office sector are two that are a little bit more opaque than the others right now, and I think need to find their footing a little bit. And you know, it will start to become more clear as we get further into the year and into early next year how those sectors are going to perform. Yeah, I mean, office space is another one. I mean, every company is different. Uh, returning to the office, some companies are adopting a new hybrid model. Uh, some are asking people to come back full time. That's what we are doing at Brown Harris. Everybody's back to work just about. What do you think office is going to look like in a year from now? Do you think it's still going to be this hybrid uh, or will people demand that you are showing up in the office? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's too early to, to know. Uh, I think different companies have ad adopted different strategies. The one thing I can tell you about the office sector is that new construction office is almost an entirely different asset class from everything else. Yeah. Uh, it seems like if you built a new office building uh, in Manhattan anywhere on Avenue D, you're going to get triple digit rents and fill your building up right away. I'm very, very bullish on new office. Uh, the fact is that an overwhelming majority of our existing stock of office buildings is very, very old, almost functionally obsolete based on today's technology. And so I think we will have a lot of class C and D office buildings converted to alternative uses. Uh, if the city can figure out a, a good uh, tax abatement program similar to the 421G that was implemented downtown after 9-11 to facilitate the conversion of uh, of obsolete office buildings to residential, uh, I think that would be a, a potential solution for our affordable housing issues. Um, but clearly, there's going to be a big shift in in the office sector. And when you when you hear a tenant just uh, took a lease for a hundred thousand square feet, uh, that could be good news or it could be bad news. Uh, if that tenant came out of fifty thousand feet. That's great news. If they came out of 250,000 feet, that's bad news. So uh, we need to see what this positive or negative absorption is going to be like moving forward. And Bob, what do you what do you make of the migration that has been, and especially during the pandemic, we saw businesses and also people move from New York to Florida. We saw a lot of that or Connecticut or, you know, some people have returned. But what do you make of the migration of actual like businesses uh, that move to Florida. Do you think that's going to remain or what are your thoughts on that? Right. Well, that's a couple of, couple of different observations about that. Uh, one of the things that I find very heartening uh, is that if you talk to residential landlords, about 75% of their new leases today are to folks who lived previously outside of the New York metro area, which I think is very, very positive uh, for New York and New York's future. 
Uh, my concern and the flip side of that is during the pandemic, who, who did leave the city and how much did they contribute to our tax base? If you think about it, uh, there are about 1,600 families, 1,600 families that pay 27% of the income taxes in New York. So if, and, and those are the folks who are the most mobile, they probably have two, three, four, five right. homes. Yep. Uh, they could live anywhere. So I interestingly, if you, if you look at what's happened in commercial real estate across the nation, uh, we see investors who are in uh, high tax states deploying capital increasingly in low tax states. In fact, if you look at states that have 3% or less state income tax, those economies are growing, populations are growing, um, investment dollars are flowing into those areas. And that's a, that's a real issue. Uh, fortunately, our, our mayor is aware of that uh, and he's trying to do something about it. But, you know, New York, I started in, in brokering in the city uh, in 1984. From 84 through, uh, through 2019, New York City had the highest dollar volume of investment sales of any city in the country. In 2020, we dropped to number two. And in 2021, we dropped to number seven. That should just not be the case based upon the fact that we have so many buildings here, so many more buildings, so much more square footage uh, than any other city. We should be number one all the time. And that that is troubling to see that uh, that we've fallen off the, the top slot. Hopefully we regain that position as people start to get more more confident about New York. I, yeah, I mean, I think we mentioned uh mayor adams and i think he has you know his plate is full with things that he is trying to accomplish just in this year i mean crime has been his number one focus which i think was correct and important because without a safe city we don't have anything really and i think he's focusing on that and also getting people like you know back to new york and here and and working and in the office and all those things which are important for a vital city to be successful yeah, and Bess, in that uh, that survey that I sent out to my clients, the number one the number one concern was politics, policy, political headwinds, regulation, uh, and it really is a big concern because when you see things that just fundamentally don't make any sense whatsoever, you look at Kingsbridge Armory. Uh, our friend Mark Messier is trying to get his uh, his his uh, many years, years, many years. He talks yeah. about how but frustrating that is. It's been yep. over, over 10 years ago, Related was going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into that building, turn it into a mall. We've lost, we've lost thousands of, of hours of employment for, for people in the Bronx because that project didn't move forward. You look at Annabelle Basin in Long Island City, you look at Industry City not getting rezoned. There, there's so many yeah, things that yeah. fundamentally just don't make sense if you want to have a thriving business community and a thriving real estate community. And some politicians might say, well, you know, real estate people are too wealthy and, you know, the business, big businesses are bad. Well, I'm not making any comment or judgment about what a politician wants to spend money on. They might want to save the penguins or do this, this program or that program or help this group of people or that group of people. It's all great. But if you don't have any money, you can't do anything for anybody. So we need a thriving real estate community and a thriving business community in order to provide those those dollars to be able to do what you want to do. So politicians on both sides of the aisle should be be hoping and praying that the real estate and business communities thrive in New York because there'll be a, a better quality of life for everybody if that's the case. No, you're that's so what you're saying is common sense. And unfortunately, sense has not been common as of late. Uh, but we do have a new city council, you know, as you know, and we have a new speaker, Adrian Adams. And so we're hoping that it will be more, you know, collaborative uh, and not drive people out. We don't want to drive rich people out. We don't want to drive anybody out. We want to get people here and building and doing and, you know, and so I'm with you, Bob, on that 100%. Um, all right. I have one last question. You write for the Commercial Observer and for any of our agents, we have a huge agent base, as you know, who want to write for our blog, which uh, is really, you know, we inspire them and tell them to get involved and write. Talk to us about your writing. You've been doing it for a long time. Does it help you in any way uh, write for the Observer? 
Yeah, I, I think it does. I think, you know, every, everyone wants to be uh, very prominent on social media. That seems to be the big thing today. But really, in order to do that, you have to create content. And if you're a content creator, it's uh, it's a lot easier uh, to do that. And yeah, I've been writing for a long time. I, I started to uh, to write a monthly newsletter to just for my clients. It was a, a private thing. Uh, the folks at Globe Street saw that, and I wrote a blog on Globe Street for many years called uh, Streetwise, I think it was a long time ago. Uh, but Jared Kushner was one of my clients. He was on the list. He got my my newsletters and uh, called me one day and said, hey, Bob, I'm, I'm buying the, uh, the New York Observer. I'm going to start a real estate uh, paper, and I'd love for you to write for, for it. And I thought about it, and I said, you know what? What the heck? Um, and, uh, I've been writing since the paper started, which I think was in 2009. And, uh, I find it's good because it, it keeps me reading. I think it's important to, to read a lot and understand uh, a lot about issues. Again, in, in, when you're talking about client interaction, you want to be able to uh, articulate what's happening, uh, and have an opinion about, uh, different aspects of our, our industry. So I think, uh, having to write regularly keeps me reading regularly and uh like like you said like these statistics are just stuck in my head a lot of that comes from just writing all the time so i think it's great exposure it helps you bone up on what's happening uh in the marketplace uh and i think you know i, I write an article and then i also i do a video series uh which we call knn which is just basically a seven or eight minute video that that goes over what that article was about uh, my team will create tweets and all kinds of other social uh, media interaction out of a, a story. So you actually can leverage it quite a bit and get a lot out of it. Um, you know, and I, I have a, a ton of followers on Twitter. I, I don't tweet. I wouldn't know how to tweet if you gave me five <laughs> days to figure it out. But you can, through content creation, you can spread your wings and and get out there to enhance your market presence. I have, I have a broker coach I work with, Rod Santamassimo, and, uh, and he always talks about market presence, that you have to be present in the market and visible and on top of mind when people make a decision that, hey, I have to sell my, my building, I have to sell my apartment. Um, you wanna be on top of mind. So the best way to be on top of mind is always be in front of them in one way or another. And so the more ways that you can be out there and have presence in the market, the more likely it is you'll get that call when that that owner decides it's time to do something. Yeah. And the writing, I think what's so great that you do that. And I encourage I write I encourage, you know, uh, agents to write for the blog because you have to understand to be understood. And writing is sort of that it solidifies that because you're writing something. And, you know, when you're writing, if you have clarity about a topic or an issue or you're fluent with it and then, you know, it helps you to hone your own skills. So I think it's great, Bob. You're you're a huge asset. I will tell you. Smart guy. You know your stuff. Thanks. And and Bob, by the way, is going to be at the Real Deal uh, Forum, which I'll be at as well. And so I'm going to see you there. I owe you a few bottles of tequila. <laughs> uh, I really do. But thank you so much, Bob. We we appreciate all of your great advice. You have such great knowledge. And uh, it was really nice to have you here today. So thank you. No, best. It was my pleasure. And I wish everybody uh, uh, best of luck out there. You know, what we do is, is not always easy. But if you have passion for it and you put your heart into it, uh, the great thing about our business is you get out of it what you put into it. So uh, I wish you all the best of luck. And Yes, thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Bob. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Bye.